It's meth. easier to get meth than any other drug in the world. Meth, and look at Amsterdam, and the drug capital of the world where just about everything's legal. Mm -hmm. You come in there with meth, you're going to get arrested and yeah, deported. Yeah, it's, 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 it's easy to make. Now, the drug capital of the world is not is saying, hey, you can't do meth in here. It's, it's, we'll it's, let you shoot some heroin. Bad. We'll let you smoke your crack. But we don't deal with and meth. And it's coming quick. It's coming that quick. That tells you something right there. All you have to do is take a look at who lives in our prisons today, and by and large, they're not white people, or, or they're disproportionately people of color. Lack of understanding, lack of pride 
is asylum to the reasons why we must get our virgin backs up off dirty mattresses and abandoned buildings and round up God's lost children. Those from the earth like a tribe of lonely bastards in a hurry but going nowhere faster. A beautiful disaster covering holes in their hearts with plaster in the big city of dreams. In a fermented wine, naturally grown grapes Straight from the vine, taste takes time to endure Tip of the tongue, run down esophagus Warm chest flutters, blessed to be put with our mothers Independently flourish nutrients to our brothers and sisters Since way back, still wise as the owl Put the down track, vision trap, time freeze frame Inside of the booth, from the same vision To my board, they restore just another masterpiece Stained to the carpet, many feet have walked And even trampled, still never got it Power to the people who embrace music Juiced up, to hear another cut Spin round, new blood bound by wax We tax at the door, consumers consume Dream by the end of the night Our ears inflict pain, permanent, permanent midnight Miles and miles of trials This is OPO here, KBMS Radio. <laughs> There's not a real look at treatment versus uh, incarceration. You have a prison industrial complex that is fed by a failed war on drugs. As a service, we wanted to definitely get out ahead of this and talk about the drug called meth. And on the phone, I have a woman who is a former user uh, and now who is a counselor. She's the a someone who has a very impressive story, and I wanted to uh, educate you through, you know, her story. Uh, her name is Holly Conklin. How you doing, Holly? I'm excellent. How are you, Opio? I'm doing well. well. Tell me, what is meth? Methamphetamine is um, a mixture of several chemicals that uh, causes uh, a person to speed. How does the drug look? It's white, uh, uh, for the most part, white powdery substance, uh, not shiny. C cocaine has like a sheen to it, mm -hmm. like a, like a uh, iridescent almost sheen to it. Mm -hmm. um, excuse me. Methamphetamine is a white and uh, kind of a pasty looking powdery substance or uh, if they wash it uh, in a process uh, with acetone and let the acetone evaporate it cleans everything out of it and it becomes clear and glassy and it's in like shards pieces and they call that ice but it's methamphetamine it's crystal methamphetamine um well I mean to be frankly honest and I guess that's if it's any good you know um, there's a uh, I guess there's two different kinds, you know, there's, uh, there's, I guess we call it the good stuff and the bad stuff, and the bad stuff is what we see a lot more of. Uh, it seems like the rural areas oh, yeah. are the places where you're seeing not only these these houses that are, that are meth labs, but also mobile units. Talk a little bit about meth labs. Well, uh, meth labs vary. I mean, 
They, people have them in the trunks of their cars, they have them in the backs of their trucks, they have them in their house, in their closets, in the basement, um, and um, underground, because you go underground to cook it, uh, the smell, because the smell is so distinct, um, they have these elaborate ventilation systems in order to uh, keep the smell down, but they're going out to the woods and they're cooking it out in the woods on prop big pieces of property where uh, law enforcement has a hard time tracking and finding and the smell dissipates, you know, before it gets anywhere where anybody goes, hey, smell that? Mm. Smells like meth to me. You know what I'm saying? Right. So the problem with production is is that the more uh, law enforcement cracks down in the big cities and in neighborhoods catching people producing it, uh, the further out to the country they're moving where it's more difficult for law enforcement to uh, get out there. They use acetone, some huh. people use diesel, some people use rat poison. It's a hall all white light, no more night, no more day. I don't expect it to stay wow. that way. And talk about some of the uh, chemicals in there. I know people always say they uh, talk about Sudafed, some of the over-the-counter uh, uh, drug that can go into making it. Of course, you know, right now they're, they're making it hard to get those uh, over-the-counter drugs. Talk about, first, some of those over-the-counter drugs you can use when making meth. Um, well, it's, uh, they use Sudafedrin. Mm -hmm. And um, and you can't really. They there are several ways to produce it. They use uh, red phosphorus mm -hmm. or a white phosphorus that they call white flakes. They use um, a farming ingredient called anhydrous. Um, those are the like that's like the main chemical that they use. And then the over-the-counter medications that they take ephedrine from is uh, another main ingredient. And they are there are a lot of states. We here in Oklahoma pass a law. You have to go through this whole huge process to buy just a box of pseudoephedrine, which is cold medicine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're all the time coming up with ways to get the drugs in order to make the mess and get around the thing that you have to do in order to procure these items. And it can be done. I mean, they're still doing it, and they're producing it in mass quantities. It's amazing. Methamphetamine makes you feel like Superwoman or Superman. Mm -hmm. uh, when you do it, you can stay up for days, you can get all kinds of stuff started at least, but a lot of times tweakers don't get anything done. What's, what's, what's it feel like? Um, you know, uh, it's like, uh, it's a body high along with a mind high. Um, the, the body high is short, lasts like about 20, 30 minutes, but the mind high, the psychological high, That'll go for as long as eight hours on maximum, and then comes the need to feed more. And that can last for like six to eight hours. That's the that's, that's danger part. It's all about that party, honey, and I'm not going to lie to you. They, it, when you're out there getting high, you're having fun. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. And, and I'm not going to lie and say that uh, you're all the time peeping and hiding and hiding in your closet getting high. It's fun. People have fun partying. It's, it's a way not to confront the issues in your life. It is a way to escape from everyday life, and that's so much easier on such a huge scale than it is to deal with the things that happen in our lives. It, how do you take it? Do you you smoke it? Do you inject it? Uh, you how do you take it? it? You can inject it. You can snort it. You can. Uh, they call it a hot rail. You they heat up a glass tube and they snort it up the glass tube and then blow out smoke. Hmm. You can do it in all kinds of ways. Put it in your coffee, they put it in pills and take it, inside capsules and take it. How, does a, how do you know if a person is tweaking? How do you know if a person is high on meth? Uh, well, uh, to a large extent, they have their pupils are huge. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times they tend to wiggle their jaw around a lot. Uh, uh, they move, their body parts will move involuntarily. Um, they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, they used to tease me and call me Ricochet because I was here and there and everywhere and doing this and doing that and just, mm -hmm. they just go, 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 and they go till they drop. Mm. Or and they go till they run out and then they drop. And then you hear people picking on their skin and... Oh, yeah. Why do they, why do you have people pick on their skin 
and ultimately cause these lesions on their skin? Um, it's a it's, it's a side effect of the drug. It makes you paranoid. It makes you it's like that's why they call it tweaking. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you get focused in on something uh, really small, right. and you think you got to get it out. Like if they have a little pimple on their cheek, they'll start digging at it in order to pop the pimple, but then it just expands across their face. Um, it, we say it speeds you up. I always wondered why they called it speed, because it seemed to slow me down, because I never could get anything done. Mm -hmm. But um, it goes into your system. It keeps you, a very small amount of it will keep you awake for several days. However, you build up a resistance to it, um, and then it takes more and more. You don't sleep, you don't eat, and if you don't feed your body, there's no fu fuel for your brain. Mm -hmm. So you become dysfunctional uh, very quickly. You lose a lot of weight, um, and there are uh, occasions where it makes you paranoid, and um, it gets a grip on you that won't let go. I've never seen anything like it, and I've never seen people decline at such a rapid rate as they do when they get on meth. Whatever you obsess on, you will do. There's I mean, logic. If, if it's sex, if it's if it's painting, mm -hmm. if it's if it's mowing the lawn, if it's doing laundry, if it's being clean, if it's playing video games, whatever you want to do, meth will let you do it for a very long time. And then you see it's it's totally obsessive compulsive. Just ain't no way to be living. I have seen some people that look horrible. No way to be living. Living by the day to say no way to be living. Perfect picture. You always hear the thing about meth now. Now, now there are people who say, well. It's not really because of meth, it's because of a lifestyle a person uh, leads. If they've been getting high for, for the last few uh, years, they're not going to brush their teeth. Uh, and so ultimately, you know, the teeth right out. Then some people say no, it's because of the acid, uh, that it, it, it uh, erodes the enamel. Ultimately, you have a dentin exposed. And, uh, it, it, so, or is it a combination? It's a combination of the two. Uh, people that smoke meth and people that inject it, um, it, it straight up eats the enamel off your teeth. Mm -hmm. The acid in it, the lye in it, the um, anhydrous, the red phosphorus, uh, the iodine, all the stuff that goes into making that straight up eats the enamel off your teeth. Um, plus, people get high for days with no brush their teeth. Right. They're more interested in pouring that quarter paper than they are in that vinyl paper. So, how does a so in in this process you have the teeth that are rotting out the mouth and are falling out the mouth? Is it painful? And and if it is painful, why doesn't that stop the person? Honey, you don't feel any pain when you're doing drugs. Mm. That's what drugs do. Mm -hmm. They mask the pain. Mm -hmm. They chemically produce the endorphins in your brain that make you feel good. Okay, and so. You think you feel good. You think you look good. So you don't feel pain. That's why people do drugs. Perfect. 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 Picture. Yeah, I'll screw off four of you guys. 
Welcome to the All club. week. Welcome. Just as long as you can put another, you welcome. know, put welcome. another blunt in my face. Welcome Give me another Narcotic. shot. Welcome to the For a line of wheat or a line of meth. Oh, I know girls that have turned serious tricks. Welcome to narcotics, and that's what I was you saying. Know? I mean, and I have no problem with it. Here's the thing with uh, sexual uh, offenders when it comes to methamphetamine. The guys do it, they're like Superman, and all they want to do is do it all the time. The women do it, and they don't want to until they're coming down, and you get a conflict. Right. Right? And right. so... So you got the man that wants to do it. He wants to have sex. The woman don't want to have sex. And ultimately, that, hey, we, we got a problem right now. That's a big conflict. You right. know what I mean? And the guys, if they can't get their wife to do it, they go out and find somebody else, you know? Right. And so it, it becomes a huge conflict in a home. And um, plus, like I said, it makes you feel like a superwoman. So some people get very aggressive. Mm-hmm. And uh, they go to beating down, you know, the first person uh, they see. It's disgusting to me, because it's like so many of these girls out here are either meth addicts or ex-meth addicts. It's like, now, now I gotta look at it and go, what did you do while you were doing it? Did what she want, went where she went, sent signals of violence. Finally they both snapped, said things they meant, but just shouldn't have said. The truth hurts worse than lies behind the back, stabby pain cries all by yourself. What's the effect on children? Well, if kids are living in a house where people are cooking meth, they're being exposed to toxic chemicals that could result in you know, early cancer uh, in, in their lives. Uh, if they're living with parents who are using meth, they're living with people who really don't care very much about them. And what we know about kids is that they need to have their parents' attention. And, uh, and good wishes and, and good care in order to grow up and function as adults. And people whose kids whose parents are, whose best friends are this drug rather than them, uh, are going to suffer. They get so high on it that they can't take care of their children, you know, and a lot of times, and, and I will say this, and it's very difficult for me to talk about this when I do these interviews. I was a single mother of two. Mm-hmm. Now, I never produced it in my home, but I was high on it all the time. And um, my kids were so adversely affected by this that um, they were angry with me for a long time. As drug users, hopefully, most of us, we try to care for our children physically. We feed them, we house them, we clothe them, we send them to school, hopefully. Um, but in every other way, they're neglected. For people producing this drug, those children are so horribly neglected. And if you give those kids a drug test in the home where the uh, parents are producing it, uh, they will come up positive. So your kids, if you're out there producing it, are getting high. You know, and even though it's like secondhand getting high, it still causes an addiction. The foster care system is being jammed up with uh, the children of meth abusers. And, uh, it's hard to say, I think, for anybody to say that foster care is better than being with a parent who's a drug abuser. Neither one of them is very good. There, there is no good solution to, to this problem, but, but uh, there's no question that it's costing everybody a great deal of money and a great deal of time and a great deal of effort to make an attempt to care adequately for the kids whose parents are, are using meth and, and who are not acting as parents anymore. My sweat, my tears. I cry. I deal with the history of drug laws. They use black and browns to be able to pass the laws whenever they want to create our sentencing. Marijuana was done like that. Crack cocaine was done like that. Opium was done. The Chinese were the ones used it to bring about laws to the opium. Is meth being used by blacks the way they're being used is being used by whites? Not in our experience here. Uh, the people that present for treatment uh, for methamphetamine are mostly white people. What is it, the, the whole deal where people feel like blacks don't use it as much as whites? Is that well, you know, that's not? changing. That's changing. That's changing rapidly. Yeah, because that's not true. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's not true. That, see, it's, it's, it is a white epidemic. I mean, I'm not trying to be racial or anything. It is a white epidemic. Um, but, you know, it's just like, uh, it's just like with, with anything bad, it don't care who you are. It's coming for everybody, and it's coming hard, and it's coming fast. I got in a lot of trouble. Uh, because I began selling it in order to support my own habit, right. you know, and uh, it, I was afraid, um, 
you know, people get in trouble, they're afraid to tell on anyone else because of uh, the ramifications uh, in conjunction with being a uh, distributor. Mm. You can take all the illegal drugs put together and they don't cause uh, a thimbleful worth of problems compared to what alcohol causes. And alcohol is legal. And they don't cause a thimbleful worth, worth of problems compared to what tobacco does. And not only is tobacco legal, it's subsidized by the federal government. But half a million people a year die from lung cancer and the other effects of, of tobacco use. So we have the two most dangerous drugs in our society that are killing literally hundreds of thousands of people a year, costing untold billions of dollars to our society. But we're not punishing people who use those, we're punishing people who use these other drugs that maybe somehow nobody's quite figured out how to tax them and, and, and generate revenue for the government. This is law enforcement. They're enforcing the drug. We know that for every dollar spent on treatment, at least seven dollars is saved in the criminal justice and health care systems in our country. And we know that locking somebody up in a prison is roughly anywhere from, depending on the state, from thirty to $50,000 a year. We can treat somebody successfully in an outpatient course of treatment for about $2,500. So that would be about 5% of the cost of incarcerating somebody. And uh, to me, that's, uh, that's a fairly simple equation. And, and a pretty good argument for uh, taking a look at the public policy that we currently have. With meth, it's like, oh, you got meth. Oh, you got paraphernalia. Oh, you're high. Oh, you're selling it. Oh, you're buying it. Oh, you're making it in a lab in your house. We're going to take your kids. We're going to take this and that. We'll take everything from you and throw you in jail for 30 days, six months. And that's There's no happened. treatment in there. It's uh, wise to use the least restrictive form of sanctions. And if treatment is one of the sanctions and there's a judge standing up there saying you better go, you better stick with this and you know, and, and there's a little reward at the end of the of the course of treatment, then to me that's a better outcome than locking somebody up, taking them away from their family, costing everybody else this ton of money, and then having somebody who's still addicted in their minds, uh, resentful and a better criminal when they get out of prison. In terms of incarceration, uh, I, I would draw a line between people who use and people who deal and uh, people who commit crimes under the influence versus those who are just keeping to themselves and sticking behind closed doors when they're loaded. Uh, those people are not committing crimes against anybody except maybe against themselves and they're sick people and it makes as much sense to lock them up as it does to lock up somebody who has a heart attack because he eats too many potato chips. I never believed I could have a life free of those drugs. I never believed I could be happy without them. But it's possible and it is so worth it. When the drugs are taken out of that person's system, you'll get that person back. And uh, uh, there's nothing better than a caring family member or, or significant other that's willing to, to stretch themselves out a little bit go call the treatment center, ask the questions, even go there and talk to somebody, maybe get an intervention done, but get that person to a treatment center as quickly as possible because that person needs your help. They can't do it on their own. If they could, they would have done it by now because there's not a drug user in the world that's addicted that likes to be addicted, that's happy with the situation that they're in. They just don't know where to turn. Drug addicts are not themselves when they're high. They're not people that you know and love. They are altered chemically. And so family members have to be very patient, right. have to be very gentle, even though it's hard and even though they may be mad and you may be angry because uh, your loved one has stolen from you or done whatever in order to support their habit. They got to be gentle. They got to reach that hand out more than once. Reach it out and say, let us, come on now, come on now. We love you. Let's get this straight. Let's get right. And uh, for the most part, the addicts will you know, over time go, all right, and sometimes you got to hit rock bottom. I know that I did. I had lost my children and my home and my job and my vehicle.